Hello and welcome to another podcast for National Inset Week 2014. I'm delighted to say I'm joined by Dr George McGavin today, who's obviously familiar to us for Planet Ant, his TV programmes, uh, Lost Land of the Jaguar, Afterlife, The Strange Science of Decay, and of course his regular appearances on The One Show. So thank you very much George for joining us. Thank you for asking me. First of all, you're well known for your love of insects. Mm. Why do you find them so fascinating? Well, that's very, very easy. Um, insects are the most diverse, most abundant organism on Earth. I suppose I really started when I was quite young. I knew that the, the natural world was the most interesting thing. But I really only developed my passion for insects when I went to Edinburgh University, so in my second year. And it was it was much the same a zoo zoology degree you know everybody was looking for birds and mammals and reptiles and trying to find big hairy things you know and yet at our feet on this field trip in in the west coast of scotland were just millions of, of ants running about doing various things and i and i realized then that actually you know you know if you really want to find things out if you want to to find out how the world works you should really be looking at insects and, and the big stuff the hairy stuff the flying stuff you know the, the wing stuff well wings as in birds you know is really icy on the cake it's not actually terribly interesting insects are a big draw we, you know you you realize that they are you know They've been on Earth for four four hundred million years. They were first on land, first in the air. Ecosystems depend on them. I mean, all the things that people enjoy watching, you know, are you know eat insects. <laughs> so you know, insects are the food of the world. They make e- ecosystems work. They are predators, pollinators, recyclers. You know, without insects, as has been said many times, of course, by the good and the great. You know. Um, Attenborough said at the end of his uh, series on on insects, um, you know, if you were to remove if you were to remove the insects, you know, the earth would fall apart, you know, sort of thing like that. And that's absolutely correct, you know. So so inse- and also the, the the other fantastic thing about insects is, if you're a biologist, no matter what your passion or your interest happens to be, it can be genes, physiology, behaviour, whatever. You know, insects are a much more useful and amenable tool to use. And you will have your results faster and cheaper. You know, animal cells are animal cells, you know, and and things are pretty much the same, really. So if you want to find out about the behaviour of so-and-so or the ecology of, of, of something, some environment, and you simply confine yourself to large animals, you, you ain't going to find out much. So this can be two questions, then. Your favourite insect or group of insects ah. but for two reasons perhaps one for your own personal what do you like and two for your work if you were doing your research what well do you I, I i began uh doing work on bugs you know hemiptera uh, and i <laughs> my phd was oh a very tedious <laughs> Affair. It was the, the the phylogenetic and taxonomic study of the British Myridae, which are you know plant bugs. So it, it was pretty sort of weird, you know. So I sort of have a soft spot for the the Hemiptera, only because I spent three years working on the Hemiptera. Um, I, I became pretty general after that because after I did, did that, I, I ended up at Oxford eventually, um, in charge of the music insect collections there. So I was pretty generalist, you know. Uh, Favorite, I suppose, the favorite insect group. Gosh, I, that's, that's, that's that's a very hard question. This one always stumps. I know it's, it's a very hard question because they they are all pretty, pretty damn interesting, really. Uh, but I'm not one of those in, individuals who has a you know an absolute passion for weevils mm-hmm. and will look at nothing else but weevils. You yeah, know? yeah. Uh, or I mean, you know, I, I wish I knew more about the wasps. You know, the the you know Hymenoptera because they they are. There's some very hard groups there, and you know I, I see them, and I can place everything into a family, of course. But I mean, to, if if you were going to take a few of the small ones, you know, a bit further, it, it takes a lot of time. So this was um, a big component of your work when you were at the museum was uh, taxonomy. So well, yes, I mean, I 
you know, in charge of museum collections, you are uh, and, and you're expected to do quite a few things. So, but you know, that that was one of the joys of the Oxford job, is that I had to do curation, I had to do just curation, answering inquiries, research, teaching tutorials, you know, field trips. So it was a, it was a very very job. It was, of course my dream job I mean I, I actually thought this is the dream job you know um, assistant curator at the museum there and 25 years after <laughs> after I started I, I still thought it was uh, a dream job and I imagined that I would be taken out of the of the, the museum my dead fingers prized <laughs> off the desk and then of course TV arrived and it, it was a really bizarre uh, thing I've always had a passion to share my love of, of the insect world, always. And obviously at Oxford I shared that with, you know, students. But here suddenly I was at the point in my career where I could reach a much bigger audience. And it was, it was actually a bizarre thing. I was on the way home one Friday night after, uh, I think, four hours of tutorials on the trot. And I had this thought, I thought, you know, if, if, I, if I have a tutorial at Oxford... I might have an audience of four if I do a cruise ship talk, which I do sometimes for you know a free holiday. Mm -hmm. I might have an audience of four hundred, but if you do an hour on the telly, you might actually get an audience of four million. And and I resigned that night. I went home. I actually hyped it out. Dear director of the museum, I resigned my post as of it. So this was still the envelope handed it in. Thing. Pretty spontaneous, yeah. And um, after 25 years, in, or in fact 30 years in academia, I thought it was time for change. And I, I know there were some TV scientists who, you know, who do both. I actually don't think you can. I really don't think you can. I think you've got to commit yourself 100% to something. You know, if you're not able to film because you're, you, you have to be in Oxford or teaching, or you can't teach because you're filming, somebody will get annoyed about it. And I think you can, I, I can now give all my energy to whatever thing I happen to be doing. In academia, it's surely important to communicate your science. And so this uh, break into TV was the ideal opportunity to, to spread the joy of what you study to new people. Yeah, Chris, absolutely. I mean, it's, it, you know, uh, I now have this enormous audience uh, of individuals who, who actually are really interested in, in bugs and spiders and everything else, you know. So I, I find it a great vehicle to, to share my, my, my passion for that, that part of the animal world. Now, you can get a bit sort of in a slot, in a groove, in a rut. And in fact, uh, after about three years doing insect stuff only, you know, I was known as the bug man, you mm -hmm. know, uh, which is fine, you know, but... The BBC wanted me to broaden out, you know, so, so having tried to make programmes about insects, suddenly they said, well, yeah, George, you can do other things, you can do, you know, other animals, you know, and I said, well, see, I, I'm a zoo zoologist, I suppose, yes, originally, uh, so uh, then, then I ended up doing, you know, the op completely opposite end of the spectrum. Monkey Planet. Monkey Planet, which was absolutely amazing, I have to say, um, it was an incredible experience. But, but but what I really want to do still, and I've been banging away at this for, for years and years, it's a long time since Attenborough did his undergrowth series, which was five parts, which is probably the best series on insects that has been produced. But things have come a long way since then. We were able to film better. We're, we, we, we have new, new hardware. We've got really high-speed cameras, which you need. Yeah, I think it's time to, to look at that again and to say, look, l let's do a big series that, that celebrate this incredible animal group, the, the insects that make up, well, the, the, the arthropods make up, you know, 66% of everything on Earth. You know, so, so it, you know, it's, it, it, it's high time. Now, having said that, of course, it tends to be the popular things that get made. You know, so uh, I, as I say, I've been, I've, I've actually been trying to have a program <laughs> made about about excrement. Now, I mean, you might think excrement. Why would you make a program about poo? You know, but actually, it's one of the most interesting things around. I mean, it's, 
you know, excrement in art, excrement in history, explosives, warfare, you know, the, the soil we, we use to grow plants. I mean, there's so much in poo, you, you wouldn't believe. And, and I just, I'm dying to make a show called, you know, The Excrement Factor with a big X, you know, or whatever, you know. Planet's poo, you know. And, and to show people that actually there's, there's interest in just about anything. So have you had any takers on this at the BBC? Lots of people going, that's a really great idea, that's a really good idea, but no, haven't had it. <laughs> <laughs> haven't had them actually press the green light yet. That's keep what campaigning, you keep Oh yeah, campaigning. well it's, it's, it's now ten years since I've been banging on about poo. So this brings us on to another point, now, quite elegantly. Oh really? Entomophagy. Oh, yeah. Eating insects. Insect eating. Well, You're quite a fan. I'm quite a fan, I, I've been doing this for years actually, uh, eating insects. First started when I went on my first trip to Papua a long time ago, 30, 30 years ago or more. And, uh, you know, you're wandering through a market as you, as you do, you know, after a hard day in the jungle. And, uh, you know, this person was offering me, you know, fruit bats, fried fruit bats, and beetles, you know, adult, you know, scarab beetles. So that's what it looked like, which had been boiled or fried or something. I thought, well, I'll try one of these. Uh, yeah, it wasn't bad, actually. Uh, but uh, I then thought, well, that's not so bad. And I, tr I, tr I tried other things. And then everywhere I went, I would find, you know, interesting insects to eat. And, of course, this is, this is exactly the thing. Any hot country uh, where insects are large and swarm, it makes sense. It, it, you know, it, ecological theory, optimal you know, foraging theory predicts that if, if you've got a resource of food that is abundant and easy to catch, it makes sense to actually, you know, you know eat it. And everywhere across the world, from Japan, Mexico, you know, South Africa, wherever, wherever you go, Arab states where there are little locusts all the time, they are eaten. And of course, we, we evolved from insect-eating ancestors not that long ago, you know. And it's, it's a very useful source of, of food, Aboriginals, Africans. And if you ask an African man, what, what is it in, in the field, I mean, what's the perfect food for humans? You'll see honey and termites. Mm -hmm. And it's actually, and, and if you analyze that, perfect food for us, absolutely bang on, all the fats, carbohydrates, all this stuff. Um, so why don't we eat insects more? Well, we may have to, of course, that's the point. You, you, you can't feed the world on beef or fish because we've fished all the fish and you can't grow enough beef to f feed, feed the world so and it's also a very inefficient thing to do as well but insects is pretty efficient so you, you can convert plant material into into insects pretty efficiently uh, and it makes good food you you may have to produce a flower of, of it or whatever but that is pretty much what may have to happen Lots of animals eat insects. We've eaten them for a long time, you know. Why we don't eat them in the West, of course, and the sort of instant revulsion that the majority of folks feel in the West. They go, oh, it's disgusting. I say, well, is it? Is it clean? Yes, it's clean. It's unhealthy? No, no it's not healthy. It's, it's, it's healthy. The, the reason we don't eat them in the West, of course, isn't to do with how they look or how they taste or anything else. It's, it's to do with optimal foraging. So if a family of four in the cool part of where we are in the world now was to collect enough insect food to eat, they would use more energy up collecting it than they would get back from eating it. So in, in behavioural, ecological terms, it's a non-starter. But in hot parts, well, you can collect all the food you need in a couple of hours. So, so that's, that's, that's where it occurs. You could farm them, of course. You could farm them in, in high-rise things. You could farm... I, I taught Heston how to, how to cook insects. Heston Blumenthal. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for, <laughs> for, for his show. He did a show uh, a few years ago called Victorian Feast, and I sh showed him how to make insect bread and, and fry some things up. So what, what, what I do is I take yeah, your humble mealworm, which I rear in a sort of hygienic way, and then roast them, mealworms, grind them into a flour and you mix you know one one gram of mealworm flour to about 14 grams of normal bread flour you know heave it in your machine and there's your loaf you know and it's a very nice tasty loaf in fact you know Heston declared my insect bread loaf to, to be very good he said so Michelin star quality Michelin star chef approved yeah there you go and it, it's amazing how actually how 
readily people will try them. Um, I did this on the um, you know on the one show, and I went to a big shopping mall and I set up my walk and tables and crickets and I just fried up crickets. And once one person had tried it, it that was it. I was cleaned out. Uh, all they all went. There were f- folks eating them in handfuls and going, actually, that's that's not bad. I said, of course, of course it's not bad. I remember I, I did a, a, a an Oxford talk for 200 kids and uh, I cooked up crickets at the end and the kids were all stuffing them down in handfuls saying, oh, it's great, yeah, it's like smoky bacon crisps. Yeah. And from the back of the audience, uh, a, a, a very angry-faced mum came stomping down and said, excuse me, my son has just eaten six crickets. And I went, yeah, and your point is? Well, at home, he doesn't even need broccoli, she said. <laughs> I said, <laughs> well, clearly, it's, it's the way you cook your broccoli. That's the obvious, <laughs> the obvious point here, I think. Uh, but, you know, it, it probably won't become a mainstream thing in the West, anyway. 